Thank you again for everything. Be with us now as we open up your Bible, as we study your word. Give us the Holy Spirit, Lord, so that we can understand it uh, and help us to be open, to be transformed by that Holy Spirit, God. Thank you for everything. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, let me open up the, the PowerPoint here. And uh, from the start. All right, so we're going to focus on the Father today. I am your father but before we talk about god um i want to talk about humans for a second here uh and and help uh, and have us realize just how complex we are as a human being so these are a few statistics that we have here uh that i'll show with you uh this one is taken from healthline uh, and it says this humans are complex organisms made up of trillions of cells each with their own structure and function most recent estimates put the number of cells at about 30 trillion cells. So what does that mean? When you, when you think about yourself, are you one person or are you 30 trillion individual lives working together as one? Uh, this is, when, you, when you really start thinking about what a human body is, who you are, uh, it gets a lot more complex than simply saying, I'm a person. Uh, because you have to realize that each individual cell that we have, each cell is alive. Each cell um, has its own function. It, it works. It's, you, can, you can take that cell out of your body and that cell will be alive. Um, so how is it though that cells which don't have brains, which don't think, how is it that when you put 30 trillion together, suddenly you get this body that thinks? All right. Um, when, you, when you start thinking about how our bodies work, it really, uh, for me anyways, it really opens up my mind to the miracle of creation, the miracle of how God created us. But it gets even more complex. Uh, when we look at this statistic, it says this, about 99% of our body is made up of atoms of hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. All right, atoms aren't alive. Atoms are these little floaty things, microscopic, we can't see them. Um, they're not alive, they don't have brains, they don't think. In fact, uh, this is saying that 99% of our body is made up of air, oxygen. It's made up of carbon, rock, right? Uh, the, the same atoms that form a rock is what we're made out of. The same atoms that make the air is what we're made out of. So how in the world can you put literally trillions and trillions of atoms, none of which are alive, together? How does that become alive? How do unliving atoms join together to create life? How do trillions of, of cells, which are individually alive but don't think, how do they create a living, thinking human being? All right. And, I, and I'm saying this so that we can realize that even when it comes to ourselves, even when it comes to trying to explain what a human being is, it's not simple. In, in one way, we're one person, uh, but in another way, we're just an amalgamation of 30 trillion cells, right? Uh, and both are accurate. Both are accurate statements. So think about this. If it's difficult to explain what a human is, how much more complex is it to try to explain who God is? All right. And that's where, uh, actually, let me read this one too. This is another interesting one. Um, it says red blood cells uh, last about four months. So your blood cells uh, are replaced every four months or so. White blood cells, the main players in fighting infections, can last from a few days to about a week. In contrast, your fat cells can live fairly long, about 10 years. So you'll carry that fat, fat cell with you for about 10 years if you don't burn it off. But what it does mean is it will die sooner or later. That fat cell will, will die off and, and leave your body. Unfortunately, you've probably replaced it by then. All right? Um, an average age of 10 years. So the bones in your body also regenerate about every 10 years. Think about what this means. 
the body you have right now is a completely different body than you had 10 years ago. On the cellular level, what you're actually made up of is completely different. You have a brand new body every 10 years or so. All right. So again, what does it mean to be a human being? All right. So with that complexity now, let's go to God. Let's try to understand uh, because it's the great mystery, right? We talk about God and then we talk about the triune, right? Or the Trinity or the, the Godhead. Uh, God is one and yet God is three. How do we explain that? Well, the easiest way is to just use the Bible, all right? Uh, we're not going to use any human theories. We're not going to use any human examples. I want to just simply read what the Bible itself says about this subject, all right? Now, many people believe that in the Old Testament, God is one, and in the New Testament, God is suddenly three. Uh, the first thing we're going to see is that that's false, all right? So let's go to the first slide here. Uh, this is taken from Genesis chapter 1, all right? Genesis chapter 1, right in the beginning of the Bible. Uh, and this is, this is what God says. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. The, the focus that I want to do here is the fact that when God speaks about himself, he speaks in the plural. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness, all right? Uh, this verse here, um, the, the Jews have absolutely no explanation, all right? Uh, they hate when they bring this, when you bring this up, uh, because they're very clear that God is one, um, and yet this verse, right from the beginning, from their own Quran, uh, from their own Torah, from their own Bible, uh, clearly shows that God is plural. Let us make. Um, for those that are interested in, in, in Islam, Islam also has this, by the way. Um, but their version goes like this. And God said to the angels, let us make man in our image, uh, which doesn't work because that would mean that angels are part of creation. Uh, which the Bible and the Quran clearly states uh, isn't accurate. Uh, but again, they were stuck with this idea of the plural because Muslims also believe that God is one. So how in the world can God say, let us make? All right. Uh, it's not the only verse. We can go into uh, Genesis chapter 3, verses 22, uh, when the Lord says this, and the Lord God said, behold, the man has become like one of us to know good and evil, all right? So right in the beginning, right in the beginning of the Bible, it makes it very clear that, that God is plural, all right? It doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't say that it's the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't explain any of that, uh, but it simply says that God is plural, all right? But then we have a problem, which is this verse here. Now, this is probably the most important verse in all of the Torah. For the Jews, this is the verse of verses, all right? Um, this is what they use to explain that God is one. This is the main, main, main verse here. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love your Lord. Uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Uh, you'll probably remember that. Jesus quotes that, in fact, um, when, he, when he's talking to the Jews when he was here on earth. But what do we do now? So now we're, now we're stuck, right? Now we have a problem. The Bible has made it very clear right from the beginning that God is plural. And yet here in verse 4 in Deuteronomy, it's saying that God is one. So is the Bible contradicting itself? Did the Bible make a mistake or is there a simple, a simple explanation or a complex explanation that uh, combines these two verses together? Let's remember that Genesis and Deuteronomy, as far as we know, were written by the same person, by Moses. All right. So this isn't a contradiction of, of writers. The same person 
wrote both of these verses. So how do we explain it? Well, again, like I said, let's not go into ideas and philosophies and examples. Let's simply hear what the Bible has to say, all right? And what we realize is that it gives us a very simple answer. We just have to jump back to Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, verses 24. Remember, um, man was made in the image of God, right? Look at what he says in verse 24 here. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. Uh, you can look this up in the Hebrew. It's the exact same word for one. There's no difference here. There isn't a distinction between one when it talks about God and one when it talks about uh, a couple. It's the exact same Hebrew wording here. And what this simply means is um, two people, when they decide, when they make a contract together to live together, to be unified, uh, God actually sees that as two people becoming one flesh. Now, obviously, that doesn't mean physically. When you married your wife or your husband, you didn't merge together and become one weird mixed body, right? You, you remain two people. Um, but the unity that should exist between the two, the love that should exist between the two, the contract that exists between the two, makes you into one. Um, this is the easiest way of explaining God, all right? God is one because of that same unity that should exist within what should be a perfect marriage, all right? And in fact, Jesus himself um, says exactly that, right? He says, I and my father, two separate beings, two separate people, I and my father are one. The same way you can say, uh, myself and my wife are one. Um, it's the easiest way of explaining it. I know people get into examples of it's like an egg or it's like the sun or it's like, you know, they give all these different examples. Um, don't overcomplicate it. Just take what the Bible is telling us. Uh, there is more than one. There's at least two. We'll, we'll find out that there's actually three. But there's at least two. There's the I, which is Jesus, and there's the Father, which is the Father God. But together, they are one. And it's as simple as that. We don't have to overthink it. We don't have to make it more complicated than it needs to be. All right? Let's go into the Father himself now. Uh, the, the focus that I'm going to do between all three of them is actually the sacrifice. Usually when we talk about the sacrifice of God, we go right to Jesus, right? Jesus dying on the cross as a sacrifice for humanity. What I'm going to teach you these next three weeks is that it's not just Jesus who made a sacrifice. All three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit individually made a sacrifice for our salvation, all right? Um, this, it, when you really think about this, when you stop and you think about this, um, it really should blow your mind. God literally changed because of us. All right. God literally changed because of us. Uh, and I'm, that's what I'm going to be showing for these next three weeks. All right. But let's start today with the father. So what was the father's sacrifice? That's the big question. To find out the sacrifice, we have to understand what the problem is that creates the sacrifice. Uh, and we find it here in Exodus chapter 33. All right. So if you have your Bible there, you can look it up or you can just look at the screen. Exodus chapter 33. Uh, this is a famous story when Moses is talking to God. All right. Uh, and this is what it says, verse 18. And he, Moses, said, please show me your glory. Then he, God, said, I will make all my goodness pass before you 
and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, and the but is the most important part of this statement here. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man shall see me and live. All right? Here is the problem. Here is the problem, and I'll give it to you through an example. Sin is like gasoline. All right? Sin is like gasoline. And as a sinner, we are literally drenched in sin. It is, we are covered in it. We are literally, it's inside of us, outside of us. Uh, we live in a world of sin. So if you, if you pictured sin as gasoline, you would picture the whole earth covered in gasoline. You would picture yourself completely drenched in gasoline. Now, God is like he literally is just pure energy. He is power. So picture him as fire, which is exactly how he pictures himself when he speaks with Moses, right? They're at the burning bush. If the earth is covered in gasoline and God is a fire, what happens if God gets close to the earth? It explodes. It burns up. All right. That is the problem that God confronted, all right? That is the problem that, that we're living in today. The fact is when Adam and Eve sinned, God can no longer be close to humanity because if he got close to us, we would simply be destroyed. We would die that very moment because the sin inside of us would burn up and we would be burnt up with it all right it's because of this that every single time you see god in the bible doesn't matter whether it's the old testament or the new testament god the father only does one thing one physical thing and that is sit on his throne all right you can go through the entire bible Every single time it actually speaks about God and, and says where he is, what he's doing, all he's doing is sitting on his throne. All right? Why? When Adam and Eve sinned, there was a problem, right? Uh, God realized the sin, realized that humanity is now separate from God. And so instantly they, they went straight into work, right? To save humanity the big problem let me get out of this here for a second uh the big problem is um how do you save someone that you can't get close to right how do you save someone if you can't even go near them and if you go near them they'll literally just die because of you uh that's the problem that god had the second adam and eve ate that fruit all right. So obviously the answer was, well, someone has to transform. Someone has to change uh, and become human so that God can now walk around humanity. All right. And that's the choice that Jesus made. In fact, if, if you read, if you read Ellen White to earlier writings, she talks about how um, God would go into the presence of God, surrounded by the Holy Spirit, that glory of God. Uh, and they debated what exactly should be done. And, and she says that three times he had to go into the presence of God and debate this with God. Uh, because it was such a serious choice that, that was going on there. All right. Um, but at the end, uh, Jesus was chosen to become that person. I will become a human being. That way I can go down to earth and save them, right? I can walk among them. I can show them who God is and then I can die in their place, all right? Uh, but we're not talking about Jesus today. Today we're talking about God. What was God's sacrifice? God's sacrifice was to say exactly where he was uh, because 
somebody had to stay on that throne, right? Somebody had to be that perfect, you know, holy image of God, right? The one that you look towards. Uh, and that was the decision that the father took. Now you might say, wow, he got the, the good end of the stick, right? He doesn't have to do anything. He stays up there in heaven. Uh, he gets to sit on his throne uh, where it's all perfect and, and happy and, and all those things. Um, but I would suggest that it's the exact opposite. Uh, think about yourself. Uh, for those that are parents, imagine your child uh, hurts themselves. You know, they fall down and they, they scrape their knee or they scrape their leg. Now imagine uh, they're right in front of you and they're crying and they're asking for you and they're, you know, putting their hands forward, but you can't go to them. How would you feel? How would you feel wanting to help your children, but knowing you can't get close, knowing that if you got close, it would actually kill them, all right? That's what God faces every single day. Um, if God the Father had the choice, I could promise you he would be right beside you right now giving you a hug. Uh, God would be right with you fixing your problems and healing you and, and, and making you better. Um, but he had to sacrifice that to remain as the Father figure, right? To remain as that holy you know, center of the universe figure. Uh, because unfortunately, it's not just humanity, right? We have all the angels, all the other worlds that were created, and someone still has to be God of them as well, right? And so God the Father had to make that choice. Uh, I want to save humanity, and the way I do that is by staying away, is by keeping my distance. Uh, there's a psalm that I'll be reading um, probably next week. It's probably my favorite psalm. I believe it's 28, uh, where it talks about uh, David is in trouble and, and maybe God will come down to the earth and deliver him, uh, except it's impossible because the, there's a verse that says just the breathing, just the air that's coming out of God's nostrils, just from breathing normally is so powerful that it's, it's opening up the oceans and showing the bottom of the oceans, right? And it's just that symbolism of, um, I want to be close to you. But I can't, because if I get close, literally the world will end. The world will just be destroyed, right? Uh, and so that's what God struggles with um, every day, right? He is forced to, to be away from us, to, to, be, to be distant from us. Uh, if you want a very good um, comparison with that, just look at Jesus at the cross, all right? Uh, for those that, yeah, I'm, I'm sure everyone know here knows the story. Uh, as Jesus was going towards Golgotha, you know, as he was being nailed there to the cross, uh, the Bible says that the, the sun went dark, right? Everything went dark. Uh, Ellen White explains that, that that's almost like a metaphor. Uh, it was a way of showing the world that when, when Jesus needed his father the most, God had to step back. God had to step away from the picture and just watch his son die, all right? Uh, imagine the suffering of a parent having to see their child literally die in front of them, fully having the power to save them, right? With one thought, with one you know, flick of a finger, he could save his son, but he, he can't. He has to watch him die in front of us. God does that with us every single day. Every single day, someone rejects God and then leaves this world. God is watching his child just die in front of him. All right? And, and there's nothing the Father can really do about it, um, which is why we have Jesus and the Holy Spirit, by the way, but that's next week, all right? Um, so I just want you to realize what actually goes through God's head, all right? It's not an easy thing that he has to live through. Let me go back into the, the PowerPoint now. Uh, and let me keep reading here. So this is, this is what you see. Every time you see God the Father, this is what it looks like. Isaiah 6, verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, 
I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one with six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another, saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord, holy, is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. All right? Um, every time you see the Father, he will be sitting down. All right? When you have the story of Stephen, for instance, uh, right before he got stoned, right? He looked up to heaven, and what does he see? He sees the Father sitting on his throne, and he sees Jesus beside him, all right? Um, that is the role of the Father. Uh, to maybe help you understand it, think of it literally as a king, all right? Uh, for those that know kind of medieval history in that, uh, the king was the ruler, right? He made all of the decisions, but he didn't actually do anything, right? The king would give a command and his right hand or one of the generals or anything like that would actually do the work. And that's exactly what we see in the Bible. Everything that, that, that is done was done through God's command, through the Father's choice. But it's actually Jesus that does all the work, all right? Um, for instance, and I don't know if I mentioned this last week, but when you look at the creation story, right? Um, God says, let us make the sky, let us make the trees, let us make the birds. But who actually does the work? Jesus does. God has the command. He has the idea uh, sitting there on his throne and Jesus does the work. All right. So that is the role of the father. Let's keep going here. To help you understand this a little bit, uh, I'm sure you know this legend. It's a, a parable. Uh, no one knows whether this story is true or not, uh, but it doesn't matter. It, it really does explain the story very well. The story goes that there is a train conductor or a, a track conductor who uh, sees the train coming and the bridge is raised, right? So he has to lower the bridge so that the train can pass so that thousands of people don't die. The problem is, as he looks out at the bridge, he sees his son playing on the track. And he knows very well that if he lowers the bridge, his son is going to die. All right? So now this man has this huge choice to make. Do I lower the bridge and sacrifice my son so that I can save thousands of people on this train? Or do I save my son and let all of those people die? That is what God had to choose. Uh, that is why Jesus had to go into, you know, his inner circle and, and debate with him and, 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 and really, you know, agree to this plan. It wasn't an easy choice. Um, it really wasn't. When, when you read something like John, John 3.16, um, and let me just read it here and then, and then we can talk about it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For, get, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. When you read something like John 3, 16, it seems easy. Okay, he just sent his son to die for the world, right? Uh, and, and I think we read this verse so many times, we quote this verse so many times that we lose just how hard of a decision this choice was. God, and I mean that in terms of the unity of God, up until this moment, up until Jesus, um, you know, was implanted into Mary, up until that moment, God had always been together. They had never been separated. They had been, they were one mind. They were one life. They were one decision. Uh, they were together their entire existence, uh, which doesn't even have a beginning. Uh, so it's even impossible for us to ration this. And they had to make the choice to make this separation, all right? Now, here's the thing that most people don't think of. Most people believe 
that, you know, 2000 plus years ago, Jesus, you know, took off his divinity, was born as a human being, lived for about 33 years, died on a cross, and then three days later resurrected. And then what? He went back up to heaven, right? And everything went back to normal. Um, that's not exactly accurate. Yes, Jesus did all of those things. And yes, Jesus went back to heaven. But, uh, and we're going to learn more about this next week. Jesus remained in his body. Right now, at this moment in, in the, the Holy of Holies in the temple there, Jesus is standing there in his human body with holes in his hands, with holes in his feet, with a hole in his side. Um, and that's Jesus. The sacrifice that Jesus made to become a human being wasn't for 33 years. The sacrifice was eternal. Jesus remains that way today, and he will remain like that for the rest of existence, which means that that closeness that existed between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, because they transcended, you know, a simple human body, that no longer exists. You know, for the rest of eternity, um, part of God has that separation. You know, Jesus isn't everywhere. Jesus isn't in every place at every moment. Uh, and we're going to get deeper into this next week. Um, and that was the choice that the Father had to make. He had to choose that Jesus would never be the same ever again. All right? That was God's choice. That was the Father's choice. That's what this 316 actually is telling us. Listen, the Father gave up who his son was for eternity so that he can save a bunch of sinners. That's John 3.16. So what is the sacrifice of the Father? There's three main things here. The first one is that even though he loves us, even though he just wanted to come down and save us and grab us and, and bring us up to heaven, um, by deciding to stay as the father figure, right? That, that center of the universe, that perfect almighty God, that meant that he could not be close to us, uh, which is why he has to send his son, all right? Any father, any mother will know just how painful that can be, wanting to be with your kids and not being able to. Uh, any parent will understand just how just how hard that is as a parent. The second thing is this. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it is God the Father who is going to judge, punish, and take away the life of all the sinners that do not choose him. Um, it's one thing having to see your children die. It's a whole other thing having to take away their life having to make that choice. Um, the third one is what we just spoke about. Having to send Jesus, who, who was literally, they were so close that it's part of God, right? He had to give up a part of himself. Uh, he had to sacrifice his son to die here on this earth. Um, and to, to one degree, keep that separation uh, eternally, never being able to have that, that supernatural unity uh, that existed before, now that Jesus remains in, in, his, in his body. All right? So what I want to leave with you all is this. Same message as last week. It's not just Jesus that loves you. The Father loves you beyond what you can imagine. Um, the Father himself, not Jesus now, the Father sacrificed everything that's important to him. Everything that's, that's, that has the most meaning to him. He sacrificed that 
for you. Think of it this way. When you read Revelations 1.1, 1, 1, uh, it says that the book of Revelation is, is the story of Jesus given by God to the angels, to John, to the churches, to the world. All right? Uh, it, you can see a hierarchy there. What you end up with is you have God who gives the message or the message is Jesus, who gives that message to the Holy Spirit, who is taken there by the angels, who is then given to the apostles, who is then given to the church and to the world. What that tells you is this. God and everyone under him is working to save you. All of heaven. All right, the Father, the Son, the Spirit, all of the angels, all of these creatures, all of them living in this perfect world, they're all working to save your life. And, and, and they don't work just nine hours a day. They work 24 hours a day, every single day, since the second Adam and Eve ate that fruit until now until Jesus comes back. Jesus is working nonstop to save you, to save this world. What are you doing for God in return? How much time in the day do you give back to God? How much time in the day do you join in that work and do you help God, not just to save yourself, but for those around you? Um, think about that. God is working 24 hours and then it comes to you and we're like, ah, oh, I'll do it later. Or I already put in an hour. Or, you know, I knocked on a few doors or, you know, I talked to someone. Um, God is giving 100%. And so many of times we give less than 1%. We do the very minimal, the very minimum that we can do for God. Realize, and this is why Ellen White says that we should, we, could, we should focus on the sacrifice of God every day for at least an hour. We have to get it into our heads just how much God turned heaven upside down to save us. We should at least be willing to give a little bit more than the very minimum to God. Think about that. And let's pray together. God, we're here today um, to be with you. The Sabbath is more than a building. The Sabbath is more than, than a service, God. The, the Sabbath is about resting from the world and just lying on your breast, spending time with you, getting to know you better, and just feeling that love you have for us, Lord. I pray, God, that you can do that for us. Help us to truly understand how much you love us. Help us to understand how much you sacrificed for us, God. I pray this all in your holy name. Amen.